Previously on the all new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. Uh, I think we're getting to the stage where, where you're going to tell the good folk at home and me um, <laughs> what we're going to be reading next month. And, uh, yes. And you've been keeping this one very close to your chest. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what this is going to be. I've been thinking that, uh, you know, we didn't really spend a whole lot of time with the third doctor. We did uh, The Face of the Enemy, but it wasn't a um, complete story, shall we say. So I was thinking, you know what, maybe uh, two Pertwee lights equal a Pertwee hole. Ooh, okay. So I'm going to go with uh, Who Killed Kennedy? Ooh! Written by, uh, it says on the cover by James Stevens, but it's in fact written by David Bishop. Ooh. And um, it's also available free online, so there's that. So if you've thought about reading along one of these months as a listener, the complete book is available... Legally. Legally, on uh, <laughs> the New Zealand uh, Doctor Who Fan Club website. As ah, the 20th anniversary edition I'm looking at. Ooh, which has a new ending after the original novel. So... Oh, I'm looking forward to reading that. I'm to it. Yeah, that's good. And now, our story continues. Welcome, everyone, to the all-new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. This is Matt in Minnesota. Chris in South London. Chris, it's June. How have you been? It, it's it's good. I may be about to experience um, a thunderstorm, so apologies if there's noises on us. Um, you may hear some ominous rolling. And it's not Thanos having got any Infinity Stones or anything, or, or the Master having kind of got some weather thing or anything. It's just nature. It's science. Strange weather patterns in the area. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, I miss strange weather. It was one of the lovely things about about classic era Doctor Who. They don't seem to experience that so much in the modern day. Not quite as often, but every no. once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, dear, dear. yeah. No, it's 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 good, and uh, it's good. We'll keep it at that. <laughs> I had a, a great time at Console Room a few weeks ago. Oh. I've got some uh, shout outs later on in the podcast to uh, listeners that I met in person. So stay tuned for that. Oh, brilliant. Got some book news to share uh, since we've last met. Mm. Um, It's been announced that Doctor Who Meets Scratch Man, the uh, long unproduced screenplay, which was co-written by Tom Baker, is going to be adapted into a novel by James Goss. Wow. This is news to me. (laughs) Cool. (laughs) And it's uh, due out in January of 2019. So uh, Brilliant. I think he had done the Cricket Men novel and then Mm. maybe City of Death, I think, too. Yes. And Pirate Planet, possibly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Cool, cool. No, this, is, this is this is this is really this is really good news. Uh, and it was also it was co-written. Um, the script was co-written by Ian Martyr as well, if I remember rightly. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for some reason, I want to say that Ben and Polly might have been in it. Or oh wow! <laughs> oddly, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I I know next to nothing about it apart from. Tom Baker was assuring everyone that it was a brilliant script, but then again, Tom Baker wanted to have a cabbage um, travelling with him. Uh, so <laughs> might, his idea of brilliance might be slightly different from other people's. <laughs> A couple of other books have also mm. been announced. There's going to be um, a few reprints on July 19th, and I'm guessing that date was chosen for Comic-Con. We've got Borrowed Time from 2011. A new version of that's going to be published. This is by Naomi Alderman. Mm-hmm. And then that's an 11th Doctor Amy and Rory book. And that'll be joined by The Triple Knife, which collects three of the shorter Doctor Who stories by Jenny Colgan into a single volume. Mm. And both of those have new covers. And then uh, in terms of new fiction, we have uh, 12 Doctors, 12 Stories, so formerly known as 11 Doctors, 11 Stories, and it's going to be republished as uh, 13 Doctors, 13 (laughs) Stories. 
That's coming out on November 1st and includes a new tale by Naomi Alderman, so the author whose book is being republished, uh, with the 13th Doctor. Um, so that's set for November 1st. I think that we talked about last month as, as being a potential pick mm -hmm. sometime down the line. Yeah. And then um, in addition to that, there's going to be three books published in October. Um, I like that they're getting back to publishing three books at a time, and all of these are going to be with uh, the 13th Doctor. And that's uh, Juno Dawson's The Good Doctor, Stephen Cole's uh, Combat Magics, and Una McCormick's uh, The Molten Heart. So mm. exciting. Yeah, yeah. Very exciting. Uh, I am steering clear of reading the synopses for any of these books because I remember I first encountered Captain Jack as a character mentioned in a synopsis to the forthcoming Doctor Who books. I think it was in late 2004 when they announced it. I was like, really? Oh, okay. I want to be as unspoiled as possible going into new series. Uh, and Chris Jimmel seems to be doing his best to ensure that uh, that's it. Because that is not a ship that's leaking at all. There's certainly thus far, or certainly at time of recording, there's precious little information going out, which is nice. Yeah, very, very much so. It's it's like when when the uh, Chibnall submarine surfaces, we get an occasional <laughs> bit of news and then it goes back under... <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah, that's cool. So, shall we? Shall we do show and tell? What would you like to show and or tell this month? Well, this month I wanted to share that I recently got a letter published in Doctor Who magazine's <laughs> Galaxy Forum. <laughs> this, <laughs> the, this was uh, issue five twenty five, the very same issue that introduced the new time team. <laughs> And it was a uh, three-paragraph letter about the new Target novelizations. They only published the first paragraph, which is fine. And what they did publish was uh, slightly edited, <laughs> which was a little <laughs> bit stranger. Um, I think in an effort to make a stronger point, they added a reference to um, Malcolm Hulk's Invasion of the Dinosaurs, which I have not yet uh, read, but there you go. <laughs> but yeah, that was... Uh, Exciting and then strange and then <laughs> I, think, I think I'm in a good place with it. <laughs> um, it wasn't the first time that I've been in DWM. I uh, got some blurbs published every once in a while back when the original version of the Time Team was going on. Oh, cool. They would publish kind of pithy comments from readers in the sidebars hmm. and I got a few of those in. But uh, really? yeah, so in the uh, Time Team issue uh there's a little letter from myself yes it's also yeah probably the least controversial thing <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah yeah if, if you're upset about the new time team then you should have bigger concerns in this world given everything that's going on in it you shouldn't be complaining to dwm about about trying to make the time team audience sort of yeah, younger i just yeah ah! <laughs> Younger and more representative. This, these are things we should be doing, people. Yeah, uh, agree a hundred percent. Oh um, dear, dear! I was so angry when I discovered all that the, the, about the whole kind of fury. I was just like, this is not something to be furious about. There are worse things in this world. Mm. What uh, do you have for show and or tell, Chris? So we went off to a trip to the theatre. In the audience, I saw a guy who was wearing a Sylvester McCoy jumper just as something to wear for night out, which I thought was interesting. But this is not the focus of my story. So last night, um, we we went to went to a festival, a music festival, uh, and uh, as is our want, and we were standing a little bit to the side from the kind of like the maddening frog, and vaguely near the VIP area, and um, out striding through the VIP area came this bloke in a hoodie um, with a kind of like a little posse behind it. And my wife sort of turned to me and said, yeah, look at him thinking he's all that. Uh, and um, I said, what past me? That's Matt Smith. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah. And, and sort of in the back of his little posse uh, was his partner. And I was just like, yeah, that's definitely Matt Smith. Uh, so uh, yeah. And uh, Later on, I, I was kind of wandering over to the bar, and near the bar was a, a chair copter thing. So you know these things where everybody gets on the chairs, all get lifts up, it's like a theme park ride type thing, or a fun pair ride, rather. Uh, and I heard a ruckus going on, uh, and uh, I heard this guy sort of say, uh, one member of staff say, "Will you please all just keep still?" And I uh, looked up and I could see that it was Matt Smith's party that was getting a little bit of a dressing down. And, <laughs> and then our eyes met, and I nodded, he nodded, and I went on my way. <laughs> and uh, it's lovely, it's 
it's amazing. You've had a doctor encounter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we did not speak, but we just we just looked and exchanged glances. And uh, I was just like, no, I, just, I, I recognize you. No one else seems to. But, I mean, the hoodie was the hoodie was almost as if, like, stuck on. But, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's good. And it's, it's also nice that he was able to kind of, you know, to sort of mingle and everything, and that he was not getting harassed and he's able to live a normal life. Because, I mean, he does like his music. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's good to see him. And I also, um, a friend of mine has seen him um, once or twice in sort of in, in pubs. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and he's just sort of a normal guy. And so, and, it, and it's lovely that he's able to do so. Do you remember who was playing on stage at the time or who yeah. he was there to see? Yeah, so he, he wandered out through um, the AAS. Uh, so I think he was there to see LCD sound system. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, yeah, because he does like that kind of thing. I mean, he's a big fan of Alt-J, so I seem to remember him uh, in interviews lecturing Jenna Louise Coleman on her taste of music being appalling. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it was pretty much his words. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's just, it's just nice to see a doctor in the wild. That's That's great. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. Speaking of seeing doctors in the wild, that uh, yes. brings us to our book selection for the month. <laughs> it does, isn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah. Doctor spotting. <laughs> yes, doctors in unusual and unexpected places. Yeah, Who Killed Kennedy by mm. James Stevens and David Bishop. Yes, only one of these people is real. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one we'll be talking quite a bit about. Yes. Uh, but to, to speak of the, the real author, David Bishop, he's a uh, Kiwi author uh, from New Zealand. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if he's the first New Zealander to ever write for Doctor Who or not. I don't Ooh. know if that there was some. Uh, I can't think. Obscure. I don't yeah. know if like Peter Lind or you know, <laughs> who knows, but one of the first that I know of. He wrote this under a pseudonym, uh, James Stevens. Mm-hmm. He uh, he wrote a couple of audios for Big Finish, uh, Full mm-hmm. Fathom Five, which is one of my favorite Unbound stories that has a fantastic ending, which I will not spoil for you on this mm-hmm. podcast. Uh, and he also wrote Enemy of the Daleks and Five Adventures for the Sarah Jane Smith audio series. Mm. He wrote another novel as well, I think. He wrote The oh, Eighth Doctor. Yep, he wrote um, The Domino Effect for The Eighth oh. Doctor and then A Morality Tale and Empire of Death for uh, the Past oh. Doctor range. Okay. I'd uh, I'd love to see a sequel to Dreamland that uh, resolves the cliffhanger from that audio. This is the Sarah <laughs> Jane Smith audio, not the, the cartoon. Okay. But... Uh, yeah, and kind of tie it into the Sarah Jane adventures. That would be something. Kind of a fun fact about David Bishop. He teaches uh, book writing, is an instructor, and does that now. And um, one of the things he does is he likes to listen to an album on repeat as he's writing. And uh, the chosen music for this effort was the uh, sneaker soundtrack by James Horner. Hmm. So A very good film. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, I I agree. Yeah, it's a it's a good one. I met him in uh, 2004 at Gallifrey One, and uh, I had forgotten that he had signed my. I must have brought my copy of my book there because <laughs> uh, I opened it up and it was autographed by. Him. <laughs> 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 I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> we have. <laughs> so. He's so blasé about it. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anything you'd want to add about the author? Um, did, did we say that he's a, he was actually a journalist? Mm, no. So um, there's, uh, yeah, <laughs> caution, this book contains scenes of journalism. Yeah, he, he does kind of go into his background quite a bit. Because my wife's a former journo, and uh, and I was uh, talking to her about some of the stuff. And she went, yeah, no, that sounds of sort of either sort of it ties in either with her experience or with sort of older colleagues is um uh, she was a you know, she was a journo in, uh, in the antipodean papers in the early noughties mm. uh, so yeah cool um the way that this book is structured it's kind of like a um like an investigative journalist piece like uh i think it was modeled on tales of the condor or I forget the the name of the... I think the, the something Tales, like that, yeah. Or yeah. Carlos the Jackal, maybe, I want to say. There's, there's some book that was modeled after, as well as the uh, Alex Ross and Kurt Busick effort uh, Marvels, which chronicles a uh, an investigative uh, photojournalist mm-hmm. kind of looking at the events of Marvel comics, like the big New York City invasions and stuff, like from the outside in. 
mm. is uh, a place that he took inspiration uh, for this book as well. And also in the 90s, there was a bit of a spate of investigative journalism, particularly of things of a vaguely occulty nature. Because I remember once, um, I can't quite remember the exact circumstances, but the only book that I was able to kind of lay my hands on whilst I was having a wait, I think it was like for some surgery or something, was this book that was trying to explain the magical, mystical forces behind the great storm of 1987. And I was like, this got published? Uh, and I was having the occasional flashback to reading that. <laughs> I was reading this. I was like, one of these is definitely a work of fiction. The other one was published. Mm. And, and it appeared to be presented as fact. Time Life had a whole series of paranormal <laughs> books like that. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. This book is set between 1969 and 1971, except for some <laughs> timey-wimey bits. Mm. And it's kind of set in a three-act structure, and each act or section corresponds to a Pertwee season. So the first season, the Liz Shaw season, is called Bad Science in the book. The second, season eight, um, appropriately titled Mastermind. And then the third <laughs> section is called Who Killed Kennedy and kind of follows on from the events of uh, Day of the Daleks. Yeah. And there are also, I mean, there are so many continuity references in this book. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, there's references to earlier encounters with like the seventh doctor and Curse of Fenric in the 40s and mm -hmm. remembrance of the Daleks in the 60s. You know, from a chronological perspective, in, in, yeah. he's James Stevens, this fictional character very much thinks the doctor the the title of the doctor extends back that far mm. and in the um, second section of the book we start getting letters home from a unit soldier so um, even though the book very much kind of chronologically follows the seasons as they play out there's a lot of overlap with different stories so for example in one paragraph you might get a reference to Tobias Vaughn from the invasion mm -hmm. and then Professor Kettlewell from Robot and then Sam Seeley from Spearhead from Space you know covering second third and fourth doctor stories but they're all happening at the same time so it's mm -hmm. uh it's kind of exciting to to read from that perspective because you really have to tease out okay well, what is this referring to or what is that referring to mm -hmm. in terms of dating uh the stories <laughs> The author sets the these stories around the same time they aired, so mm. kind of sidesteps the unit dating controversy. <laughs> yes, yeah. One thing that I would say as well is because um, I mean there are some some characters that are unique to this book. If you do like the sound of this, because we are going to spoil the book, um, but this book is free for legal. Yeah, it's completely legally free for you to to read if you go on to. Um, the um, Doctor Who New Zealand thing, just yeah, search Who Killed Kennedy New Zealand and you'll, you'll get the link to it. Do please, if you are thinking, oh, I'm, I, I might actually want to read this, stop listening to our, our programme, read the book, don't Google any names you don't recognise, because uh, <laughs> I, I did, and I accidentally spoiled myself, and, and a large part of this. There's something that most people will know happens, in it because it's quite famous for that but there's a lot of other kind of twists and everything and yeah yeah i, I think it is yeah something that you should go and read you have the opportunity um you know you don't have to kind of fork out you know 90 pounds or so to kind of get a secondhand copy from ebay from someone you don't really trust um or download a dodgy pdf or something you know you're, you're able to get this legally i would i would implore you to go ahead and do it yes pause us now and then Go yes. read it and then come back. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Um, and on, on the website, there's lots of extras too. So there's like um, interview with the author. Mm. There's author commentary for each chapter. Um, there's a photo file that was meant to be published with the book, but ultimately was dropped. So you can see some pictures from the different stories and a brand new ending. <laughs> Too, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about at some point yes um, it's available it's all available online um the only other thing i would say about this kind of before we start the recap is it feels very life on mars so that the vibe of that television series i think mm. um Okay. Just in terms of the the grittiness and the yeah early seventies nature and just the the music and the soundtrack. I mean, it, it it very much feels of that era to me. Yeah, yeah, and there's also a lot of kind of like political events that get sort of that get tied in as well, which I find quite interesting and quite fascinating. Yeah, because that that's one area that like uh, 
that was avoided, I think, during the Pertwee era is you didn't get a whole lot of commentary on, like, say, Vietnam or other events. You did occasionally with, like, some of Malcolm Hulk's scripts, you know, and yeah. tying to, like, should should Britain join the EU and various strikes and, and things like mm-hmm. that, but, but not so much global events, you know, maybe a little bit in the mind of evil, but, but that was about it. Yeah. You know, and it was, and when it was such one, it was by metaphor. Um, mm-hmm. as well. so, All right. So let's uh, begin. Um, yeah. The book opens with a young Kiwi journalist named James Stevens. He started in the business on the day of the Kennedy assassination. And he's <laughs> <laughs> more on that. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, he's moved from New Zealand to England. Mm. He's uh, married the daughter of a disapproving lord to kind of cause a stir. And he's begun uh, making a name for himself at the Daily Chronicle. One day he receives a tip from a porter at Ashbridge Cottage Hospital claiming that a man with inhuman blood has been brought in following a recent uh, meteor shower. The press has refused entry into the hospital by Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart of the United Nations Intelligence Task Force. You can guess which story this refers to. <laughs> and this brings us to our dramatic reading for the month. Yeah, and that's uh, Care of uh, Andrew P. Street, who is a um, not a New Zealand journalist, but an Australian one, and who has uh, published um, many fine books on politics and also Australian popular culture, and uh, is uh, is also no stranger to uh, Australian radio, podcasting, or even TV. And is also a very big Doctor Who fan and general geekery. So uh, yeah, thank you, Andrew, and here we go. The stiff-backed man in the uniform of a brigadier had entered the reception area to be confronted by the barrage of cameras and questions. Like Captain Munro, he was clad in a neatly pressed mushroom brown uniform with unit insignia prominent on his beret and up his sleeves. The brigadier carried a chestnut wood swagger stick and his black moustache bristled with anger at this media ambush. Can you tell us anything, sir? asked one reporter. What about? Is it true there's a man from space in there? The brigadier snorted disdainfully. Nonsense. I don't know where you get these stories. Is there something odd about him? I know nothing about a man from space, he replied evenly. I decided it was time I got a question in. Then why are you here? The brigadier swiveled to size me up, hesitating just a moment before answering, Training exercise. He shoved his way through the sea of hacks, followed by a young woman who slipped her way through the crowd almost unnoticed. She wore a brown and tan jacket with matching mini skirt and her brown hair was pulled up into a tight bun atop her head. An assistant, I wondered, or perhaps the brigadier's personal secretary? Yet her eyes were piercing and gleamed with intelligence. This was no mere office typist. The brigadier dodged a few more questions before slipping through the double doors to go into the hospital itself. The assembled media were left scrabbling around in reception, trading ideas and trying to talk the story up into something significant. The theory was that the mystery man had found one of the meteorites and had either been injured by it or else was refusing to reveal its whereabouts to unit. Either way, the man with the human blood from outer space angle was going to be hard to back up without any solid proof. Twenty minutes later, I spotted the brigadier, identified by a fellow hack as somebody Lethridge Stewart, escaping our attentions via a side door and into his staff car, which quickly sped away. It was time to phone the office and report our progress, or lack of it. But the hospital lines were jammed with other reporters, so Tubbs drove me to the nearest pub to use their phone instead. There, the bar was full of talk about layoffs at the nearby plastics factory and how automation was killing British industry. I jammed a finger in my spare ear as I tried to get through to the Chronicle. The chief reporter called us back to the office. Much of the story had already been splashed across the front of one of London's afternoon papers, the Evening Standard. Unless I could come up with a new angle, my piece was likely to be buried down the news pages. All right, and that was the press conference from Spearhead from Space. And uh, Stevens returns to London to kind of write about the government cover-up of the meteor shower uh, and he ignores the drunken man he be- meets in the bar, uh, Sam Seeley, who claims to have found one of the Thunderballs. And when the book, when the story is published, he finds that all the mentions of Unit have been removed from the story. Um, but he receives an anonymous call, uh, and the person on the other line is commending him on his work and claims that there's still a lot more to tell about the story. But before Stevens can follow up. London is crippled by the events of Black Tuesday, which is a terrorist attack 
in which um, hysterical members of the public report seeing window dummies come to life, and he uh, forgets about the mysterious call for the moment. So one thing I was going to say about um, the about, about kind of like the start about how um, James Stevens, you know, he, he he's you know, he works on the day of Kennedy's assassination. He's kind of coming; it's his 18th birthday, and he gets sort of taken in um, as a kind of like a, as a treat by I think it's by his dad, isn't it? Um, and that echoes with my wife's um, um, journalistic history to an extent. She, she'd been kind of working quite late and has kind of gone off for have um, an early night, one week night in September. And this was September the 12th in Adelaide, uh, September the 11th in America. And her mum let her sleep through, didn't wake her up. And she kind of woke up and was sort of like, the biggest story of my journalistic life has happened. Yeah, and she, she, by the time she got into the newsroom, they'd done everything that they needed to do um, for that day's paper. Um, but it, it, it did make me kind of think of that because kind of, you know, Stevens is, is kind of, you know, the Kennedy Association has such a huge impact upon, upon him and his life, of which we see a lot more later. But it was, it was this interesting, just kind of like this, this echo with, with my wife's experience. Um, hmm. but it's, uh, yes. So very self-indulgent, but, <laughs> so, but uh, yeah. Yeah. That um, reminds me of, I, it was a, there was a quote, a Kennedy quote, see if I can find it here. Mm-hmm. It's it's in the commentary on the website. Something about the past um, mm. rushing forward into the future and yeah. like there's not really a present, but it, it seemed somewhat applicable to that story, yeah. but I can't yeah. find it. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so we've had this um, um, this, this mysterious call that seems to be getting about, and um, a little while later, a mysterious plague hits London, and, and particularly Waterloo, a station that I often go to, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I think of at the events of the side of the rooms. <laughs> uh, and uh, Stevens uh, receives a call um, from that anonymous source of his, directing him to a research centre on Winley Moor. And uh, Stevens calls the centre in a surprise when the phone is answered by the mysterious Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart, who hangs up when he realises he's speaking to a journalist. And, uh, and this this very scene you can watch in uh, Doctor Who and the Silurians. So, uh, although the plague is quickly contained, uh, Stephen has become intrigued, and so he decides to have a little bit of further investigation when he spots the Brigadier in the background during a broadcast about um, the return of Mars Probe 7. And uh, whilst he's interviewing Ralph Cornish of the Space Centre about British scientific development, Stevens questions him about the impact that the um, death of Tobias Vaughan has had on the scientific community. And Cornish refuses to answer, directing him instead to Vaughan's former associate Ashley Chapel, or better yet, unit, or Department C-19, a name that seems to cause Cornish some concern, even as he mentions it. In Stevenson's private life, he's kind of, yeah, he, he and his wife are, um, are, are having a sort of, of a difficult patch. And uh, and then he, um, well, I was going to say romantic encounter. I don't think it's, <laughs> I don't think there's a lot of romance involved. He has an encounter with a redhead that, uh, who picks him up after, at a party uh, after he's had his story on the Wenley Moore incident published. Mm. Uh, but... Yeah, yeah. And the reference to Sally Chapel is mm. from uh, Craig Hinton's Millennial Rights. Ah. She, she was a character, a unit character from that. Okay. Um, okay. And C nineteen, mm. that does get a mention in the in the actual Doctor Who television series, in Time Flight of all stories. <laughs> um, it's kind of like the offhand reference to the Braxiatel collection in City of Death. Yeah. Um, but then C-19 is picked up and used in a handful of novels, um, most notably Gary Russell books. Hmm. And there's a, a blonde C-19 agent that appears in this novel that is seen again in uh, The Scales of Injustice. So there's some... Um, Overlap, yeah. Yeah, with that. Stevens begins to kind of probe into unit's true nature and, and its agenda he starts to get harassing phone calls and death threats and visits to his home from agents of uh, c19 uh including the blonde agent that we just mentioned who's in uh, scales of injustice and he refuses to bow to that pressure and keeps working on his story collecting evidence from those whose 
paths have crossed unit in the past. Um, he meets with Isabel Watkins, uh, who's a photographer, but he dismisses her claims that uh, Earth was once invaded by robot men from outer space. Uh, she was the photographer with uh, Zoe in uh, The Invasion. But he's intrigued by her, her claim that uh, C-19 also discredited her uh, deliberately and forced her boyfriend to stop seeing her for fear of jeopardizing his career in the Army. He uh, meets up with Greg Sutton, who claims that there's a green slime from the center of the Earth that uh, transformed research scientists into wolf monsters, which uh, I think is the events of uh, Inferno. Indeed, yes. And then uh, has, he's gathered enough material then, kind of as the events of the, the first Pertwee season wind up, to, <laughs> or, or wind down to uh, write his piece, which mm. is an expose of a shadowy organization with a suspiciously vague mandate to protect mankind from quote-unquote outside threats. And then there's the matter of the Doctor, which uh, James Stevens, the narrator, uh, identifies as an agent provocateur, mm. a mysterious figure who appears at different events, almost like a code name like James Bond, mm. um, who appears at the Shoreditch incident, which is, um, I think, a reference to Remembrance. Yeah. And then the Sea Day f fiasco, which was uh, the War Machines, uh, the death of Tobias Vaughn, the invasion, and the Wenley Moore incident, each time with a different face. And he also notes that sometimes the different doctor agents are operating at the same time. He mm. says that uh, the second doctor, who he calls the Gatwick <laughs> doctor, uh, the events of the faceless ones take place concurrently with uh, the war machines. So you have two different doctors in different parts of London at the same time, battling two different things. 1966, was a bit, it was busy. It was a busy summer. We, we had the World Cup on, and we had Sea Day, and we had the Daleks were sniffing around, faces ones. It was busy. That's what happens when the doctor regenerates mid-season. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. We, we also get an interesting detail about C-19 that they morphed out of uh, countermeasures which was the group from mm. uh, the Shoreditch incident, uh, Captain Gilmore, which I think Big Finish has a whole series around, uh, yes. audio adventures around them now. Yeah, uh, and there's also, when, when they're talking about the countermeasures group, there's, oh, I forget her name now, it's Rachel, isn't it? Um, mm. So the the, um, the younger blonde member of countermeasures, uh, she uh, leaves in disgust fairly early on. Which I I haven't I haven't listened to the big finish, so I don't know. Um, I suspect that, that probably doesn't happen. Mm. Yeah, yeah, in, in, interesting. Quatermass even gets a nod <laughs> with a uh, <laughs> reference to the British rocket group mm. in the section, as he did in Remembrance of the Daleks on TV. Yeah, it carries over. Yeah, from yeah, that so one. It's, it's cool. So Stevens, as you were saying, he's convinced that yeah, the, the Doctor is his kind of code name. He concludes his article with a demand that the public be informed of Unit's true agenda. And he's really, really pleased about, uh, about this article. Is that going to be published in Metropolitan Magazine? I think it is. Um, it? Oh, I think the first one was, was in the Daily Chronicle. Or yeah. no, did he get fired from... Or I don't think he, he gets he, fired he, yet. He, he does kind of change jobs in you know, Metropolitan Magazine. Sarah Jane Smith fans does get mentioned. But yeah, so on the day that the article is going to be published, uh, it's kind of killed without ceremony. And Stevens is called into the editor's office and he's given a generous offer to forget all about it. And he stands up for his principles and is dismissed without a severance package. Uh, and he's charged with a breach of journalistic ethics and told that he will never work for another major paper again. And uh, then when he returns home, he uh, discovers that someone has given his wife photographic proof of his encounter with the redhead and that she has returned home to her father. Stevens tries to contact her, but uh, um, Lord Howarth uh, is... Uh, uh, shall we say he's not best pleased? Uh, that's her dad. And uh, so threatens to kill him if he shows his face near her again, having given him quite a beating. Having lost everything, Stevens um, vows to make good of the situation by exposing the unit um, for um, the wicked threat that he believes they are. Hmm. And then uh, Stevens manages to get his career restarted as a freelancer, working for different magazines like the Metropolitan, which you mentioned. And he eventually strikes a book deal based on a series of articles about the political misuse of scientific technology. So all the uh, big scientific uh, 
research projects that go haywire during Pertwee's first season, mm. uh, he decides to connect all those and, and make a, a book about it mm. called uh, Bad Science. And there's a real life book called Bad Science. It, it's, a, it's about bad manipulation of, of kind of like scientific facts or kind of stories and absolutely fascinating. Nothing to do with this, but uh, mm. but but, but uh, a, a very interesting read about how people misuse stats and the like. Mm. Bad Science was going to be the original title of this book oh, okay. before Who Killed Kennedy, before they decided to add on the, I guess the the JFK elements were, were very much a late addition. Mm. Um, and we gloss over one earlier, but the book does open with kind of a presentation of an alternate history of, you know, what kind of a thought experiment of what would have happened if JFK had survived. And the implication is that throughout his first and I think into his second term, the world situation gets much more volatile. And um, it was probably the wrong course of action for him to have lived because it would have er, results in um, or a nuclear exchange with uh, with Russia. Yeah, it's quite chilling, isn't it? Um, mm. Part of the reason why uh, sort of things deteriorate quickly after his... Uh, attempted assassination is that the attempted assassin is found to be uh, wearing kind of Soviet uniform, and it does make you kind of just think just how close we must have come at that point. Mm. Um, yeah, j- just as with um, the Bay of Cuban, Pigs and yeah, the Cuban Bay, Missile yeah, Crisis, the crisis yeah. yeah, yeah, scary times. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank goodness the world's a peaceful place now. Hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 Um, um, so the royalties tied him over while he writes a second book and he's still fascinated with the legend of JFK. So he writes a speculative work suggesting what might've happened if the president had lived. He continues to collect evidence about unit planning to write a third book, which will expose the organization and its secrets. He gets a lucky break when a contact gets him into a press viewing of the experimental Keller process at Stangmore prison. Stangmore Prison, of course, is the where we saw the riot in uh, mm. that short trip story where the master escapes. <laughs> uh, then uh, he sees a white-haired man called the Doctor, who doesn't match the earlier descriptions of the Doctor that he was familiar with, which I think at this point were the seventh, first, and second. And the Doctor's there observing the process on behalf of UNIT. Stevens leaves convinced that he's just witnessed a government-sanctioned experiment in mind control uh, that goes wrong. And shortly after he departs from the prison, a riot breaks out and is quelled, um, not by the guards or the local police, but by unit troops. Which must have been quite strange. Yeah. (laughs) Why is the army against you? So if you watch um, The Mind of Evil, there is a section Mm. where a group of journalists and observers are led into the room Mm. um, where the doctor has his conversation with Stevens in the book. So uh, you can visually see James Stevens in the mind of evil, even though mm. we don't necessarily know which which actor is <laughs> playing him. <laughs> there isn't anybody with a New Zealand accent. Uh, but it's interesting that when he's interviewing, just thinking back to Greg Sutton and, uh, a bit earlier, because Greg Sutton is clearly Australian in Inferno, uh, and there's no mention that I recall of, of that, and uh, certainly sort of references if, I mean if they are two very different countries but when people from Australia and New Zealand do have a chat there's sometimes they, 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 there may be a bit of shall we say banter um, but um, but yeah, if there is any then Steve just doesn't share it but, but it's mm. interesting yeah and the, the, David Bishop did seek out kind of those interactions with the show where mm. um, like you had mentioned the phone call the Brigadier gets mm. in, in the Silurians um, just moments like that where kind of the this story intersects with just enough with what we saw on a television. Mm. And so I have a theory as to why this book was written by um, by an Antipodean. Um, mm. um, I don't know about New Zealand, though I do remember going to New Zealand and visiting there and sort of seeing repeats of Doctor Who. Um, but certainly in Australia, it got repeated quite a lot. And certainly, yeah, and Doctor Who, rarely got repeated up you know, here in the UK. Uh, and so most people when they were watching Doctor Who would be they would be kind of familiar with um with, with these kind of like fourth generation video copies which of of repeats from Australia and New Zealand. It would be brought back here to the UK before uh, before before repeats started airing on satellite television. 
So you had this interesting situation where obviously a lot of the British fans would be quite familiar with the Target novels and the older ones would be familiar with their memories of of when they saw the programme when it was first aired. But the people that were most familiar um, in fandom with that that was sort of shown on air would have been the Aussies and the Kiwis. Mm. This has to have been both clearly, you know, to have written this you have to have been a fan, but also you have to have a real close encyclopedic knowledge it would have to have been from just having absorbed tons and tons and tons of Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, my, my theory. <laughs> As I say, it's a it's a Venn it's a Venn diagram with a very small uh, intersection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where this book lives, yeah, yeah. And I think probably yeah, Tim Bishop might be the only person that could have really written it. Though I know of a few other journalist Doctor Who fans from the antipathies. <laughs> but but yeah. Uh, yes, yes. You had mentioned he was a reporter. He worked at the New Zealand Herald for five years, um, and I think that's what he bases his at least the the initial chapters where he's talking about the Daily Chronicle and mm. some of the different people in the bullpen um, mm. kind of relate back to, to they're either people or amal- amalgamations of people he worked with in real life. Yeah, and, and, and it definitely comes across as such as well. Mm. Uh, make time narrative. Stevens is writing a piece about the government's secret experiments in mind control. And at the end of the article, he invites anybody that has knowledge of any such experiments to contact him. And so this is how he meets um, a homeless woman, Dodo, who uh, had suffered a nervous breakdown uh, during Sea Day, uh, which is what we know as the war machines. Uh, So we finally get to know what happened to Dodo, bless her. Uh, And she's unable to remember what happened to her that day. Uh, and uh, since then, she's uh, suffering these weird sort of visions of one-eyed reptile men, um, gunfighters in the Wild West, and games of living dolls. <laughs> we would know what they all are. Uh, and she was shuttled from one hospital to another, um, so given electroshock therapy, uh, to deal with psychotic patients, and, and she's eventually abandoned in this facility called the Glass House. There, its uh, brutal director was questioning her repeatedly about uh, a doctor, or possibly the doctor, and uh, eventually kind of kicked her out on the streets where she was um, uh, mentally unstable and she wasn't even able to remember where the glass house actually physically was. Uh, but as Dodo tells her story, Stevens comes to realise that she's still a bright, intelligent young woman, and he offers her a job taking care of his home whilst he conducts research and writes. And she moves in, they become friends, and then a little bit more than friends. Mm. It's quite lovely. And you just feel, oh, poor Toto. Yeah, when Dodo left the series, I mean, she wasn't even really given an on-screen exit. She mm. was in, uh, I think, episode one of The War Machines, and then by episode, she may have been in episode two, and then mm. by the end, it's like, oh, she's staying somewhere in the countryside, and... Yeah. She doesn't even get enough, and I think she was only in four or five stories, so it was a very, I mean, not as short of a tenure as, say, Katerina, but, uh, you know, s- still really short. So it's nice to kind of pick up that strand and, and find out what might have happened to her um, after yeah. she leaves uh, the Doctor and Ben and Polly. And um, the glass house here gets, mm-hmm. I guess that's like military slang for any you know, secret military prison. Um, here it has more of kind of like a hospital connotation. Mm. But um, this, the glass house is also referenced in several um, new and missing adventures. And I think even in some of the eighth doctor and past doctor adventures. So yeah. I think it may have been introduced here first, but yes, it yeah, I think it carries says, on. It yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. The glass house um, features in *Scales of Injustice*, um, book that we referenced earlier, as as well as uh, appearing in quite a few other Doctor Who fiction. So at this point, Stevens, uh, the narrator, continues to work on his expose about Unit, and he eventually lands an interview after much persistence with Professor Elizabeth Shaw, mm-hmm. who once worked in an advisory capacity for Unit. She's not able to answer most of his questions, though, because of the Official Secrets Act, partially because she doesn't think that Stevens would believe the answers if she she told them. Uh, and she's also worried about Department C-19, which is keeping her under observation. 
Stevens leaves that interview empty handed, but then he's beaten senseless by uh, the blonde agent who tells him to stop messing with C-19. Sometime later after that, the terrorist Victor Magister, also known <laughs> as the Master, is arrested following an incident in the village of Devil's End. Uh, Stevens learns about while well, he's watching TV with Dodo. Uh, <laughs> they're watching uh, BBC Three, the recently <laughs> launched channel, which uh, was still hadn't really been launched at that time. No. Um, I think that didn't come until the 90s. Uh, later than that, uh, um, Nauseous. And it is no more. It, well, it's, it's, on, it's, on, uh, it's on the internet. Now. So you go BBC 1, BBC 2, BBC 4. Home of class. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Although Torchwood originally debuted on BBC 3 too, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Then uh, the Master's arrested following what happens in Devil's End, so the events of the demons. And the media becomes saturated with stories of uh, Victor Magister's supposed terrorist gang who are blamed for everything from Black Thursday through mm -hmm. the plague outbreak to the failure of the World Peace Conference. So the media conveniently blames everything on the master, even though he really wasn't involved in Series 7. That's so unlike the media, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the um, government chooses to have like a public trial where the, the, the trial is broadcast and Stevens is invited to appear on a television program uh, discussing the controversial decision and about having a public trial. And then he takes that opportunity while he's live on air on BBC Three to accuse both UNIT and C-19 of using the Magister as a scapegoat to divert attention from their own incompetence and corruption. And I think it's one of the first times both UNIT and C-19 have been mentioned on air anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, uh, later that night, his house is firebombed when uh, both him and Dodo are, are inside it. And as they're trying to escape and get to safety, he's attacked by that same C-19 agent who tries to kill Stevens with a revolver. Uh, Stevens fights him off and reports the incident to the police. Uh, he goes into the New Scotland Yard. Hmm. And while he's in there, uh, the police turn him over to C-19. Uh, and, and then he gets beaten unconscious in a... Uh, in an interrogation cell at the police station. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 quite it's quite chilling stuff. But also, when you were saying about life on Mars earlier, um, yeah, there the, the, there were um, uh, how should we say? Certainly, there's been a lot of kind of um, scandals and exposés over the years about some of the antics of the police in the seventies, and uh, yeah, it, it doesn't feel completely unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, so, anyway. One interesting tidbit about Liz Shaw. Mm. In all of her appearances um, in this book, she's smoking out of a pipe. Yes. Yeah. She, she's a very keen smoker in this, isn't she? And uh, <laughs> that was something that Carolyn John had suggested that she do on camera in Series 7, uh, which was nixed by the producers at the time. Mm -hmm. But then um, in the BBV Probe series that she did in the 90s, she was always seen smoking a pipe in that. <laughs> so so the pipe reference is, I think, a callback to those uh, Probe videos she had done um, earlier in the 90s. It, that interview scene with her is quite interesting because um, she is very choosy about the questions that that she's being asked. I mean, she kind of coaches him, doesn't she, always to kind of to to ask certain questions. She's steering the conversation. It's quite fascinating. It you know, it, it's interesting seeing this other side of of Liz. You get a real sense in that interview too of just of her intelligence level, mm. where she you can you can see the. I think it's conveyed that you can you can kind of hear the gears turning in her head where she's she's trying like as you said to steer the conversation a certain way mm. and she's being very clever and careful in in the words she's choosing i've always enjoyed this show uh, and uh, i think she's one one of the most underrated companions of the classic era and partly because you know she's really, she's not in that many stories um but uh, but here i mean you know, this is i think one of the most interesting portrayals of her she really does come across as you know uh, even though you don't find a lot about her, she comes across as as you know, a fully fledged person. I, I feel as you, you you do really kind of get a sense of it because it, it's interesting that she's even having this interview. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and uh, so, you know, she, she's obviously felt sufficiently uncomfortable with some of the things that sort of unit have got up to or that she's seen. And it's just fascinating. Okay. It's really fascinating. Anyway, it's enough of me waxing lyrical battle this show. Uh, oh, so. no, I, I, I agree, agree 100%. She's also one of my favorite companions for all the all the reasons you listed. I think yeah. one is is that we're really left with wanting more, to mm. just given you know that she's only in the four stories. Yeah, so Stephen um, wakes up um, from the beating to find himself in the glass house. And so this used to be a military hospital where um, traumatized soldiers were brought in for psychological treatment, but it's long since been taken over by Victor Magister, who's turned it to his own ends. And then we realise that Magister is the brutal director who'd been torturing Dodo for information on the doctor. And then when Stevens hears Magister's voice, he realises that this is the guy who's been tipping him off all the way. He's been phoning up little tidbits. And so the master's been hoping to use Stevens as a pawn to stir up trouble for unit. But Stevens has gone too far. And now he's threatening to expose um, the master's ties to C-19. Um, Stevens meets uh, an inmate of He's got a sharing cell with a guy called Francis Cleary, who's been writing letters sort of throughout the book thus far. Uh, and he's he, he experienced the events of uh, Devil's End, and he's become a little bit unhinged by it. Uh, he's also sort of killed a prisoner um, in, the, in the riots in the mind of evil, it's particularly because he feels that he's seen the devil uh, in the church in Devil's End. Mm. Yeah. And uh, keep an eye on him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's nice to see that uh, the master's still using these tricks today of the anonymous phone calls with the, mm. uh, <laughs> the woman in the shop. <laughs> yes, yes, isn't she just <laughs> to Clara? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh. So then Stevens uh, and Cleary uh, escape the glass house after Cleary beats to death one of the nurses, who's. Uh, watching over over them and, and administering uh narcotics to them they they managed to escape and find their way back to london i wasn't sure where the the glass house was in terms of the do you know geography wise where um, was it evansham or uh, I'm, not, I'm not remembering where yeah i can't where remember it was but it's it's out in the home is it the home, home counties? counties. Is, home yeah. counties, yeah. I don't think it was in a real... Well, certainly if it was in a real place, it wasn't that I, I noticed or recognised. Okay. Apologies they, if you lived there. <laughs> <laughs> they they managed to make their way back to, to London, and Dodo's excited to see that uh, Stevens is all right because he had been missing for three or four weeks at this point, uh, recovering mostly unconscious from the brutal beating he had gotten at the police station. Um, Stevens reaches out to his friend Vincent Mortimer, who is a TV producer working for BBC Three, and arranges for a special edition of The Passing Parade, which is the same show that was uh, profiling Devil's End and the Demons. Um, but they, they want to go back to the glass house to expose the, the secrets of it and kind of do an on-camera kind of reveal of the glass house, not unlike uh, kind of the tabloid journalism of... Uh, I want to say, was it Al Capone's vault with Geraldo in the 80s, where uh, they make this big showing of finding Al Capone's vault on television, and they okay. they have like a two-hour special, and they open it up, and it's empty. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, excellent. Uh, yeah. Wow. Whoops, yeah, it, I've never heard of that. Yeah, it was a big deal at the time. It was kind of in the yeah. mid-80s in the States, but it... This seemed like it was maybe a, a reference to, to that, perhaps. Mm. But um, I think it was a reference to something else, actually. Where oh. I, I think it was a reference, um, potentially, of sorts, to Ghostwatch. It, it was something that was broadcast as fiction, because the BBC was still doing a kind of like a, um, a, a TV movie on a Saturday night. But it, it was done with TV uh, presenters that everybody knew at the time including Sarah Green from um, from Attack on Sidemen. Uh, and it was about a um, it was about a poltergeist. Uh, and uh, they were sort of doing an investigative journalism -y stuff at the house. Uh, and then you had Michael Parkinson, who's a kind of a very famous British presenter, uh, was in the studio in London as suddenly kind of some of the craziness from the poltergeist suddenly started appearing in television centre. 
and it got so many complaints because there were so many people who tuned in halfway through and thought it was real and thought that they were watching Possession happening live on BBC One on the Saturday night. Yeah, not unlike uh, War of the Worlds, mm. kind of. Yeah, yeah, and, and it caused huge controversy. I think the BBC got sued because there was uh, there, there was an unfortunate incident, I can't remember the details of it, that spiralled off from it. Uh, and uh, so it's never been repeated, but certainly um, people that... Re- I remember watching it, and I, I, but I knew that it was fiction, and I remember loving it. But, mm. uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I wonder whether there's whether it's like maybe it's a bit of an echo of that. Certainly, I was wondering that. Mm. But, uh, um. So while they're leading the camera crew to the glass house, the soldier, the unit soldier, Cleary, uh, he remains in the studio and he starts rambling about having a mission to save the world by preventing a good man from dying. Mm -hmm. And he wanders off set when the producer cuts away from him. And then the stunning conclusion of the program comes when, you know, Stephen leads the crew to the doors of the glass house and they find everything inside has been stripped away. And not only that, but there was a clever layer of dust added to everything <laughs> to uh, make it look like it's been abandoned for years. So this makes you know James Stevens kind of humiliated live on television and kind of ruins the career of the BBC producer he had reached out to. And he returns home to find that in his absence, uh, Dodo has been murdered. Wow. And he comes home to a very gruesome scene. Yeah. He was, you know, his alibi, of course, was that he was live on television at the time. So he's absolved her of her crime. But uh, eventually, yeah, eventually. <laughs> yeah. But um, he sees an odd metal ring on the floor, recognizing it as uh, belonging to Cleary. So um, he knows that Cleary was was there and, and probably was the one who had killed Dodo. Cleary must have been under the master's influence all this time. And to make matters worse, it, we find out that Dodo was pregnant when she died. Um, yeah. <sighs> Poor Dodo. Yeah. Poor Dodo. This, um, we should mention, I mean, this is this is a crystal clear example of unfortunate trope of uh, called fridging, mm. where a uh, protagonist's uh, girlfriend or wife is killed under, you know, really gruesome circumstances, and that acts as like a catalyst or motivation for that character to continue in the story this is a pretty textbook example of that trope unfortunately oh, yeah. but uh yeah the, I've, I've got more more discussion on on dodo <laughs> later <laughs> later but um yeah uh yeah just wanted to to mention that here though yeah and, and it's notorious in doctor who fandom as well is mm. um the um, the doctor who books had got a reputation for yeah, um, grisly deaths befalling um, former friends of the Doctor. But I mean, this. I mean, even though, I mean, I'd never read this book until we read it for the podcast. Uh, but uh, yeah, I knew that this happened. Didn't know the exact ins and outs of it. But uh, yeah, it was just yeah, it, it, it's it's very well known for. It. In fact, I think I think it gets mentioned what, in the first paragraph of the Wikipedia entry for the book. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. There's also kind of a misnomer or a belief that still persists in fandom circles that, you know, that Dodo contracted syphilis in the books mm-hmm. and that's what she died from. And that's just simply not true. She contracted an illness in The Man in the Velvet Mask, which uh, mm-hmm. could be described as like a sort of space herpes. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yes, it could be contracted through drinking water or consuming contaminated food. And she lived from that and she was cured from that. And then completely separate from that, she's murdered in this book by Cleary uh, working under the, ma- the master's brainwashing. Um, and mention of syphilis doesn't occur in either novel. Mm. So um, I'm not sure where exactly that rumor first came from, <clears throat> Radio Free Scaro. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, it's, it's not true. And she, uh, yeah, they're completely unrelated events that, that got kind of conflated together. Yeah, but, but a, a, certainly a very traumatic and short life for Poor Dodo. I just, mm. just feel so sorry for her. Um, yeah. But... Yeah, so Stevens, um, emotionally shattered, um, spends um, spends a week at a seaside resort, 
and he's just he's just an absolute despair and devastation until um, he sees a TV report uh, um, indicating that UNIT is providing security for uh, another one of those uh, world peace conferences that seem to happen in Britain quite a bit in the 70s. Um, and uh, this one's over at Audley House. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no problem for guessing which story we're about to reference here. Uh, so, um, determined to uh, find out the truth about UNIT, uh, Stevens heads over to expose uh, Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart by any means necessary. Uh, just as he gets there, he sees the delegates being evacuated, and then when he tries to get closer, he's attacked by this weird, monstrous, ape like being. And then he's saved by the doctor, um, and the house then explodes. And in the aftermath, um, Stevens is recognised and he's taken over to Lethbridge Stewart for questioning. And the brigadier takes Stevens to a tent where an autopsy is being conducted upon uh, one of the ape-like things. And then Stevens realises that this is a genuine alien. It's an ogre. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's talk about grisly detail, but, but the, you know, the blood oozing from it. And it is, yeah, it's quite very much like some of the, um, the 90s sort of uh, alien autopsy type mm, things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, which uh, was clearly the vibe we were going for here. <laughs> Stevens um, goes back to his hotel and now realises that no one's been covering up an evil conspiracy. The truth is just simply being held back because no one would believe it. And uh, all the time that Stevens thought that he was crusading for the truth, he was being manipulated by um, the master, causing trouble for an organisation whose only agenda is to protect the world from outside threats. And so now he rather grimly concludes that his life's been destroyed, his lover has been murdered, and he's got absolutely nothing to show for it. Mm. He uh, then becomes suicidal, uh, mm. and he's got uh, the revolver from earlier. Just as Stevens is about to kill himself, he gets a memo, like a telegram delivered from the doctor. The the doctor, after encountering him at the house that, that explodes, and you know after the events of the autopsy, uh, reaches out to Stevens and preventing Stevens from... Uh, committing suicide and uh stevens decides to call the doctor back at the phone number that he was given in this memo um, which is the doctor's kind of personal line and we learn that the master who um was is not as securely you know under lock and key at his prison as as we thought um has been using the glass house to brainwash traumatized soldiers such as cleary and turn them into his pawns and um, the ring that uh, Stevens found, it turns out that that's a time ring, not unlike what we saw in uh, Genesis of the Daleks mm. in, in that season. And um, the master intends to create an army of time-traveling assassins to kill important historical figures and shatter the structure of the space-time continuum. And Cleary was kind of one of the, the prototype in this in this army and is, is the first one and is um, going to to kill Lee Harvey Oswald, thus preventing the assassination of President Kennedy, which could potentially cause enough ripples to, you know, disrupt the Doctor's time on Earth and potentially even erase the Doctor from existence. So um, the Doctor's kind of telling Stevens all of this on the phone as they're having a conversation, and uh, Stevens realizes that he might still have a chance to save the world, so... He uh, takes the time ring, which is already preset for Dallas on November 22nd, 1963, and kind of following the doctor's instructions, um, transports himself there uh, by activating the time ring. Um, reading with disbelief, um, you know, he's here in Dallas. Stevens heads for the book depository. But uh, on the way, on the grassy knoll itself, I believe, he uh, runs into the master who uh, claims that he planted a time ring and arrange for Stevens to come here because he's not too sure whether Cleary can actually carry through his assignment. And also claims that Dodo was under his control all the time to choose with Stevens. So, yeah, the master's being his usual charm himself. Uh, so Stevens refuses to believe any of this and enters the book depository. And uh, there he's able to overpower Cleary uh, and knock him out, but uh, not before Cleary's done the same to Oswald. So as the motorcade approaches... Um, the master contacts Stevens uh, through Cleary's communicator and gives him a simple choice. Stand by, let history crumble around him, or kill Kennedy himself. 
Stevens tries to shoot the master, only to find uh, that the sight says rifle and misaligned. And as the master flees, shots ring out from a grassy knoll, and Stevens catches a glimpse of the real assassin through his rifle's telescopic sights before his view is blocked by a screaming crowd. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in, in this section, we get a lot of really great detail about Dallas and the square and Kennedy's itinerary for the day. And, you know, we see uh, Zapruder kind of getting up in a tree mm, yes, with his eight millimeter camera, you know, getting ready to film it and all sorts of little details that uh, you can tell David Bishop had done his research. And of course, I think it was all popularized at the time too oh, with yeah. uh, the Oliver Stone movie mm. um, came out around this time. The Quantum Leap episode, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> which is which is actually a really or certainly I think so. It's one of the better Quantum Leaps. It's really really good. What do you yeah. think about the Master's revelation that Dodo was under his control the entire time? I know James Stevens doesn't want to believe that, but it would explain why Dodo didn't recognize the Master on TV. You know, um, it would, but I just choose not to believe it. I just because I just feel sorry for Dodo, mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. I, 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 well, whenever the master is saying something, I always kind of uh, work on the basis that the master is telling telling lies. Um, mm. But but yeah, yeah. I and mean, certainly I mean, it. It's it's very well recent. It reminded me as well of have you read eleven twenty two sixty three, uh, the Stephen King novel? I haven't, but I've heard good things about it. Mm, it yeah, it's it's very good. I'm not a big Stephen King fan. That, that that's a brilliant novel, and and it's yeah, sure, it's obviously touches upon you know, <laughs> you know more than touches upon events of of, of kind of Kennedy's time, but it, it tells a, its own really brilliant story and uh, i think if anyone listening to this has enjoyed who killed kennedy and haven't read that book then i i I, I suggest they do so Mm. it's uh, certainly for my money one of the better Stephen kings that i've read which is not a lot the master in this Mm. in this scenario he's um if so if you look at the zapruder film He's the mysterious man dressed in all black, holding a black umbrella, mm. standing on the grassy knoll, which is a real person in mm. history uh, yes. that that Bishop in the, in the narration you know replaces with the master. So I, th- I thought that was really clever, and um, uh, you know it ends with this odd revelation that you know Stevens catches a glimpse of who the real assassin is, and mm. um, it, it also ties in with the telescopic sights were misaligned. Because the the first shot that goes off from Oswald's gun, um, you know, misses entirely due to the misaligned sights, and then yeah. the the conceit here is that the two remaining shots, rather than coming from Oswald's gun, instead come from this mysterious figure hiding behind the <laughs> fence on the grassy knoll. We later find out who that is, but yeah. um, so at at this point in the book, who did you think it was going to be? Because I I had a couple of ideas as to as to who it could be. Yeah. I was thinking it was either like another version of the master potentially, or perhaps the third doctor. Yes. That's what I was thinking. Or even the seventh doctor. Hmm. I was thinking it was going to be a doctor, but yeah, because like you could imagine, you could imagine the seventh. But yeah, speaking of, of the seventh, there's, there's a magical little scene that we, that we kind of skip through when we were talking about Stevens as kind of post Dodo despair. Because um, he he has a he's a funeral for Dodo, which he's the only mourner because uh, it's all you know, because so very few people knew her, um, and he's at the graveside and uh, he meets this small dishevelled man with an air of sadness, um, and um, who lays a uh, um, like a, a white flower on Dodo's grave and. It's not. It's not stated that it's the seventh doctor, but it just feels like it is. Mm-hmm. And, and it's a rather beautiful scene where he, yeah, he's just the doctor's kind of showing compassion for Stevens, and it's just. Oh. I was thinking it was the seventh doctor as well. The author in the commentary for that bit says that it's either probably the second or the seventh doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, the dialogue certainly points to it being the seventh doctor. But the author said he likes to think it's the second doctor, 
um, <laughs> just because it's, you know, much more close, I think, you know, to when he would have mm-hmm. traveled with Dodo. Um, yeah. But I just don't think the second doctor could really steer his TARDIS properly like that. No. Unless it was maybe the 6B doctor. <laughs> Yeah, but also the seventh doctor was all about tired loose ends, wasn't he? And mm-hmm. It felt it, it feels very, very Celestial McCoy. It does. So then, after this revelation of you know mm. Stephen seeing who's behind the the fence, he drops the rifle, and so you know Oswald is unconscious at this time, and he's starting to wake up, so history can resume from that point, and then uh, Stevens grabs. Uh, the unit soldier Cleary and they travel back home with the time ring leaving Oswald to his fate. The time ring gets them both back in one piece, but it looks to be probably unusable at this point. Mm. Cleary suffers brain damage on his return trip and is taken to the hospital, um, leaving Stevens with no proof of this incredible story, but he's lets it go at, at this point. And in the years that follow, um, he slowly puts his life back together, starts teaching journalism, um, educating students such as uh, Ruby Duvall, who is in Iceberg, Mm -hmm. and Sarah Jane Smith. I didn't, this is one part I didn't really care for was that Sarah Jane Smith was one of his uh, journalist students, because if if this is following, you know, the continuity in the in the TV series, I mean, she's already a well established journalist by the events of the Time Warrior, which, you know, happened right after this, you know, season 10. Unless maybe in his mind, there is a gap. And well, then she's from the 80s. But it, it, yeah, it, yeah it's, it's, it's a bit, it, it, it does feel a bit of a contrivance, because like, when Metropolitan Magazine was being mentioned earlier on, I was expecting Sarah Jane Smith to appear there. And like in my mind, she's there in the background. Um, mm. Yeah, it does seem a bit odd. And also to shoehorn uh, Ruby Duval, who is very much a footnote in Doctor Who, <laughs> into this. I'm just like, uh, yeah. Yeah, you didn't really have to take that, Sarah. You know, I'm from 1980 line at face value, I think, to to mm. make it work. Eventually, after the death of uh, Lord Howarth, uh, his ex-wife's father, he's able to speak with his ex-wife, and he reconciles with his estranged son. And, um, he, you know, decades later, he writes his memoirs, and he prepares to fulfill his destiny to use the time ring to go back in time once again, because the person that he was, uh, he, he saw who had taken those shots, um, was himself aged much older. And every day he looks in the mirror and he sees his reflection and he's getting closer and closer to that time. So he's, he's thinking that there's just enough energy in the time ring for one last, um, flight. And about a year before, so that around 1995 or so, he meets up with uh, Cleary, who dies and kind of on his deathbed, the soldier says, who's been in and out of hospitals his whole life, he has kind of a moment of lucidity. And he says, you know, please write this down and share the story and tell what happened. And his mother at that point gives uh, Stevens the letters. So the book ends with and again, this is the the published paperback version. The book ends with uh, him getting ready to take that final trip back, and the person that kills JFK is in fact the author James Stevens himself. But then, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, but then um, we have a we have a new ending. Mm, we do, we do. So if if you've not read the new ending. <laughs> Then again, this is another moment where I suggest we put things on pause. If you think, oh yeah, no, I remember the book. Yeah, you don't remember this bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So before he's getting ready to, you know, travel back, and you know, the ending of the the book as written, and then he is going. You know, he's tidying up loose ends. He he knows this is going to be a one way trip, so he's getting all his affairs in order, and he um, comes across the phone number from the doctor one last time and he looks at it and he decides to call it because he remembers something the doctor said to him about it was kind of a transitional line where the third doctor is saying you know i used to think that history can't be rewritten not one line you know referencing what the doctor told barbara in the aztecs Mm. but the the doctor is realizing that you know maybe only certain fixed points in history are, are unchangeable so um 
Stevens is thinking there might be a little bit of leeway there. So he calls the number and he calls again and he calls again. And I think it's eventually he has to call for something like 19 times a day for five straight days. And then the phone finally picks up and a gruff Scottish voice <laughs> comes through the other line. And uh, <laughs> it's uh, Peter Capaldi. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, the he's calling the twelfth doctor, and the twelfth doctor says, "Meet me at Dodo's grave tomorrow." And mm-hmm. so uh, James Stevens goes to Dodo's grave, who, which is at this point, you know, been overgrown from decades of uh, neglect. As he's kind of cleaning up the grave site, the doctor appears behind him. So then the doctor talks to talks to Stevens. He learns, you know, about what he saw. Stevens implores him to, uh, you know, is is there another way? Can mm-hmm. we can we can we change it? And so the doctor decides to give him a chance, and the doctor takes a sonic screwdriver and modifies the time ring, you know, asking him very clearly, okay, when and where do you want to go? So rather than traveling back to stop the master's plan in 1963, he travels back to the day of the events where Dodo is murdered, and he, you know, while he's live on air by the, at the glass house, this older version of himself goes to his apartment uh, finds Cleary, uh, shoots and kills Cleary in a struggle, in a fight, you know, to try to take the gun away from him and um, fatally injures himself in the in the process. So the younger Stevens comes home from the glass house and rather than finding uh, Dodo murdered, you know, she's very much alive and he sees the elder version of himself who warns him, you know, don't touch me because of the Blinovich limitation mm-hmm. effect. And uh, the Twelfth Doctor had warned Stevens, he said, you know, if you use this time ring again, it's going to dis- disintegrate and you will be lost in the time wind. So rather con- conveniently, he takes the, he you know, kind of throws himself over Cleary's body, activates the time ring and uh, mm-hmm the body disappears and Stevens and Dodo are able to have the happy ending that was denied to them previously. So Mm. (laughs) (laughs) that's who killed Kennedy Yeah, Um, Yeah. with complete with the new ending, which really does reverse the, Mm. the ending of the book. You know, it it creates a a happily ever after scenario. I do think that um, does introduce some new continuity paradoxes, though, because um, by not by Cleary dying in 1971, you know he didn't visit Cleary on his deathbed in 95, didn't promise mm. to write the complete manuscript, didn't get the letters from his mom after the funeral that were included in the book, um, but he still has a f- copy of the completed manuscript, which the older Cleary had kind of gone back through time and handed him and was like, read this. So it feels a bit like a bootstrap paradox, but it's not, it doesn't (laughs) completely line up for me because I suppose he could have gotten the letters from the mom some other way, or maybe I'm just thinking about it too much. (laughs) Well, but also this is a book that referenced Day of the Daleks, which suffers from the exact same problem, Mm. or it's a similar similar problem. So uh, yeah, Um, so maybe to think is if it's good enough for Day of the Daleks, which is, yeah, which is very fondly regarded in fandom. One of the things as well that's quite nice about the Twelfth Doctor section is that at one point he sort of, he, he wonders whether this is kind of Missy up to her old tricks. And so I was thinking, when is the Twelfth Doctor, because this book was written before Capaldi's last season was aired, but I'm wondering, is it when Missy's in the vault? Uh, I think it would be after Death in Heaven and like yeah. around the time of Asylum of the Daleks where you have that, you know, that big gap where the Doctor mm. learns a guitar and does the tank stuff yeah. and... Uh, it's when it's meant to be, but I do yeah. wonder. A little bit of me did kind of wonder whether it was in the But also, it was this wonderful kind of shock of something really going, oh, <laughs> Capaldi? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was great. I read the 20th anniversary edition, and, and it was just, yeah, it, it was it was wonderful seeing that bit. And I was like, right, well, clearly, this is definitely the new stuff. We're in new material here. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so what do you make of it? <laughs> uh, I mean, it was it was a it was a great book. Um, I liked it a lot. Um, I thought it was unique. It was imaginative. I liked how it wove a story like in between the cracks, so to speak, of the yeah. the Third Doctor era. Um, I don't know how much I like the new ending, kind of reversing the. I I mean, I've I've lived with 
the you know for 20 years you know dodo died in this book <laughs> and now she didn't um so that takes a little bit to get used to i guess i th- i think it's good that they they david bishop kind of undid the whole fridging of dodo trope mm. um but i think her death was you know a shocking and really bold choice at the time because i think it was the first time a companion had been killed off you know in mm. in the extended media scales of injustice happens or was published after this um <sighs> I'm not entirely sure, hmm. but I don't want to say more. Okay, <laughs> well, we'll, say, we'll say one of one of the first companions. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's definitely one of um, the first. Yeah, there was a spate of them hmm. towards the the back end of uh, of Virgin's um, time with the license. I guess for me, I mean, if if they're going to include a romance like that, and then it, it have it in, involve like a murder, I guess I would have been more okay with it having been like say a minor character like mm. isabel watkins mm. from the in, in the from the invasion as opposed to a, a companion i mean either way it's bad because you're killing off a female character to motivate the male character's arc or journey mm. but setting that aside yeah i i've never really cared for being dodo the one who, who was killed off but this new ending fixes that <laughs> so it's, yes. i just have to i think let it you know kind of simmer and and stew for a while and, until i can fully process that uh that that's kind of what happened now um mm. what did you think about it like you were saying i think it's quite clever like how it it, it finds the story in the gaps but i mean it's it's own story i mean this isn't a kind of like a this isn't tying all the various dots together and hoping that there's a compelling story in between um you know this isn't continuity for continuity's sake it, it it does manage to tell its own compelling story that i think could be read as a compelling science fiction novel in its own right without necessarily any real knowledge of unit mm. um I, I think you could you could put this in the hands of a non-fan it was certainly one of the first doctor who books i had read and i you know didn't have access or regular access to the internet at the time to look up every single reference when i read mm. it so kind of reading it as someone who had just come in with the TV movie and maybe read, say, one of Peter Haining's books, mm-hmm. um, I was able to, to follow the plot, you know, thinking back to my 16 or 17-year-old self mm-hmm. pretty well. And in revisiting it 20 years later, I enjoyed it just as much, if not more so, especially mm-hmm. knowing kind of how it weaves and dips in and out of different stories and, and pulls them all together well mm-hmm. at the same time, like you said, being its own unique thing. Yeah. It was always fascinating for me when you see the Doctor through other people's eyes, and uh, and here you're seeing not just Doctor, you're seeing Unit, you're seeing all, you know, all these various kind of characters just from from other people's viewpoints, and and it, it's it's quite fascinating. It does make you think. It's quite yeah. Um, I, I yeah. I, I, honestly, I really enjoyed it. If you were going to rate this one, how are you going to rate it? Ten. Ten. Really. Ten. Yeah. Ten out of your first ten. Yeah, my first wow. ten. <laughs> Yeah, I am gonna give it an eight out of ten. I guess I'm gonna I docking it slightly. Um, one because of its pacing, I think it's marred maybe slightly by having to follow the story beats of the different televised stories. So you get mm. into a bit of a predictable pattern in the narrative yeah. where the journalist is stumbling into the events of each story. Then they get threatened or chased off. Then it's kind of rinse and repeat, um, except for the demons, which he watches play out mostly on TV. Mm. Um, And then I'm also deducting a point, I think, for the treatment of Dodo as a plot device, which, to be fair, the new ending does fix. But, Mm. um, and I am glad that the new, the new ending exists. But um, yeah, just those, those two things took me out of it a little bit. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a really solid eight um, Mm. for me. I mean, I think for me, because I knew that fridging was going to happen, and that I'd known about it for what, 20 odd years, um, I, I, I'd kind of like come to terms with it. Yeah, as you were saying, clearly it's a bad thing. But um, yeah, it, it's different from because there is a major media story, and I'm just going to be very careful with my phrasing on this. Uh, and and also, Matt, this isn't. I'm not necessarily talking about the movie that I've seen that you haven't. Um, <laughs> so, um, in which a fridging happens, and I was like, oh, in 2018, you shouldn't be releasing a movie in which a fridging happens to you know, to, to empower the hero. Uh, and and yeah, yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. Here, I just 
because this is something I've always associated with this novel, if anything, I, as I was expecting it to be possibly grislier than it was or something, maybe. Um, so, uh, yeah, and it just it did add this poignancy that when, because I didn't know that, uh, that Dodo and Stevens would become lovers, but uh, the Dodo was like, oh, no, because <laughs> like, I know what's going to happen. <laughs> So, yeah. at least I thought I did. <laughs> so, with the with the with the new ending, does that mm. would you say it enhances your enjoyment of the story? Or yeah, I think it okay. does. Okay, I think it does. Yeah, I think I'd have still given it a ten, even it, even it, without. It, yeah, because I just I because I was just reading it, I was just thinking I don't know if yeah <laughs> I was just like it wasn't because I was itching to give a book a ten, but I was just kind of thinking. If I yep. don't give this a 10, what am I going to give a 10 to? Because I seemed mm. so close last month mm-hmm. <laughs> with Voyager. But, mm. yeah. 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 Because there's lots of lovely nods to British political history and various other things. There's, there, there's sprinklings of, of various facts. And so it was, it was yeah, it, it, it was done. It was done with love. Mm-hmm. And, and clear passion for the material and it's extremely well written and, and engaging mm. too and there's there's so much to appreciate in it and lots of little fanish details and kind of nuggets to pick up and enjoy um i would love to see a new series version of this with like say a blogger following kate lethbridge stewart um mm. we get a taste of that with clive and rose mm. and, with, <laughs> and with uh linda in love and monsters but it'd be really cool to see a book written kind of like this, David Bishop had some ideas for a sequel because this one only goes up to the events of Day of the Doctor, but he had researched far beyond that. Um, he originally wanted, and this is I'm taking this from some of the the interview material on the New Zealand fan site, but he had mentioned that he had wanted um, the book to originally span 25 years, but it really only covers two years of kind of real time on Earth because. Once you get past the unit years, um, very little happens, which has any noticeable effect on Earth, you know, from a global scale, you know, maybe like the events of the 10th planet and maybe Battlefield, but not a whole lot from like a global catastrophe sort of thing that's that's on the news everywhere. Yeah, it's true. I guess this was originally going to be a missing adventure set sometime between the war games and the sea devils. Generally, missing adventures are set between stories that are next to each other. But <laughs> this, you know, that gap spans three and a half seasons. Yeah. And uh, one other tidbit from that interview, it says, according to his royalty statements, uh, just over 13,000 copies were sold. So that's kind of an interesting indicator of maybe how many Doctor Who fans there were you know, kind of like the hardcore fans in the wilderness years, like down to around. Um, I mean, I'm sure there were more than that, but yeah, the, yeah, the, it's a uh, interesting to. There were also there were people that were were not reading the books. I knew quite a few fans at the time that weren't, and also there were people like me who I mean, I was always a bit cheesy because uh, you know I was it was my pocket money. <laughs> mm. uh, so if something got a a good review in DWM, then I'd be more inclined. And for something that was outside the ranges like this was, uh, we're going, like, I don't know, that sounds a bit weird. So um, that's why I, I didn't buy it, um, which is a shame because uh, I, mean, it's like, I love Scales of Injustice, which I read roughly at the time that that came out. And uh, I think I would have been, I'd have greatly enjoyed this. I know Face of the Enemy came later, mm. but kind of has a similar yeah. sort of thing well, where you're, yeah. yeah, yeah. The paperback version of the book has a fun um, wedding invitation in the back, a tie-in to uh, Happy Endings. <laughs> and it has a, printed invite to Benny and Jason's wedding to be held in 14 years time in the year 2010. <laughs> well, that was kind of fun to, to see. There's, there's lots of people in happy endings that are from the Netherlands that have evacuated because uh, it's been flooded due to global warming, <laughs> uh, which uh, mercifully Paul Cornell was wrong on that. The book ends with the doctor saying he's the third doctor saying he's going to uh, pay the master a visit because it doesn't. It sounds like his island prison isn't as secure as the doctor <laughs> thought, and I think that leads into uh, the Sea Devils. Yeah. When you think about how many stories the Master was in, you have to wonder how many different simultaneous schemes he has going on in his mind. <laughs> like, like is he? You know, as he's standing there with an umbrella on the grassy knoll, is he thinking about his uh, alliance with the Sea Devils? <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, is, is he already planting seeds with the ogrons um, and uh, and stuff for frontier in space? He's a busy guy. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or a gal. Yeah, well, yes, yeah. And, uh, I, and I can never go past the circus without looking at it as um, we, we are very much in circus period uh, in the uh, in the UK in, in our summer at the moment. And I drove past the circus today and uh, I found myself looking to see if there are any horse boxes that looked a bit suspicious. Mm. Anything else you want to uh, mention about your first 10 out of 10? Um, I, I really just enjoyed it so much. I mean, it was it, it was a very good story in its own right. Mm. That, that was the thing that I enjoyed. Yeah, I, I very simple. So, listeners, if you mm. ignored our previous warnings and didn't uh, pause it and listen, <laughs> go ahead and pause it now and go read the book anyway. It's still worth your time, even if you're oh, spoiled. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I, mean, I was spoiled about one of the events, and yeah, I, I enjoyed it very much. It was definitely one that I wanted to do justice to because I feel like yeah. you know people have danced around this novel for oh, so yes. long that it's, yes. it's, it feels so good to just finally have it completed. Mm, yeah. It, it has kind of you know, influence and echo and, and it was a, a lot better than I was kind of expecting because I've, I've heard people kind of give it a kicking, but I think the kicking is more to what happens rather than how it's written or anything at all like that. The treatment of Dodo I thought was well mm. done. Like it wasn't, it didn't seem like ham-fisted or... No, I mean, she felt like an actual person. Yeah. Yeah. All right, shall we move on to uh, listener feedback? Mm, yes, that's... Well, we don't have any emails again this month, but there could be. I could be announcing your name right now. <laughs> All you have to do is email us at andwbcpodcast at gmail.com, and we can put your feedback here. Um I did want to give a shout out to the listeners that I met in person at Console Room. Mm. It's a bit cool and kind of surreal to meet people out of the blue that already know you. <laughs> <laughs> I saw uh, listeners Elijah Kraling and Ben Ellis. Uh, you can hear Elijah mm. on last month's uh, Reality Bomb podcast. Oh, cool. And Ben and I killed it in a trivia game based on the $100,000 pyramid and won some prizes at the convention. I got a plastic deformed Titan Dalek and Ben got a TARDIS <laughs> friendship necklace so lovely lovely gifts that keep on giving they are yeah um it was also great to hang out with uh jeff and felicity uh felt like mm -hmm. coming full circle a little bit because they were both uh former guests on the original version of the doctor who oh. book club podcast um each having guest starred on multiple episodes back in the day and um Sean Lyon from Gallifrey One made a surprise appearance too. He flew out for the convention last minute and it was uh, fun catching up with him. We had first met back in 1999 at the first Convergence where Gary Russell launched the Doctor Who era of Big Finish and debuted Sirens of Time and where Evil and Smythe was dreamt up. And um, Gallifrey One's uh, Hotel Day was also that weekend, so it was really interesting seeing kind of the chaos and the whirlwind that is Hotel Day from the other side and <laughs> <laughs> Sean's reactions to everything. Uh, but he is a consummate professional and uh, was making sure everything went as smoothly as possible, so that was pretty cool. And we ran a full-color ad in the program guide which turned out very nice um just a nice way to get out word about the podcast mm -hmm. um and it supports the convention at the same time so that was cool to see and turned out well cool how about on the facebook side uh, facebook we've, we've had a few likes no comments that, uh, that, that i recall seeing uh, so apologies if you just managed to send a comment in the last hour or so. Do, do please like and comment and stuff it is always good to hear from the listeners Mm. Uh, it thrills our heart with glee. A few polls we did recently on Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, we asked about kind of the variety of ranges again and kind of what listeners wanted to hear most. And uh, our listeners like the Virgin New and Missing Adventures the most with a clear majority, mm -hmm. followed closely by the Panini DWM comics. Cool. Interestingly, both the Benny New Adventures and Torchwood tied in the spin-off category, mm -hmm. followed by Faction Paradox, the Big Finish printed books, and the Iris Wildtime books. So Benny and Torchwood appear to be equally popular. The new series books came in last, sadly, but uh, still lots of interest there. So <laughs> thanks everyone who voted in the polls for doing so. I think that'll help, you know, potentially inform some of our future picks. Mm. 
as to yes, yeah, uh, I kind of like the going through the doctor cycle that we've we have yeah. been doing as well too. Yeah. A few specific Twitter comments. Daniel Martinez writes, "Oh wow, just discovered this podcast. Great to see more people talking about the books after the previous podcast that did something like this had stopped. I hope the podcast goes well, and it's great to see Frobisher the Penguin get more recognition." <laughs> He had tweeted a picture of, from one of the Big Finish recording sessions where they had a like a mock Frobisher in the studio with them as they were recording, which is kind of cool to see. Yeah. Cool. Stephen B. writes about Voyager. Great intro to a series that I've never read before, but have long been intrigued by. Mm-hmm. I may or may not have squeaked with delight when you announced next month would be Who Killed Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, cool, cool. And then uh, The Curse of Cedric wrote, uh, Voyager was his favorite DWM strip, and that he's lucky to own some of the original artwork, Oh, which he tweeted us uh, some pictures of, cool. which was cool. And then uh, finally, we got a special note from Paul Schoons. <gasps> uh, yes, about mm. Voyager, last month's episode. He said he enjoyed listening to the podcast. <laughs> And that he's very fond of this period of the Doctor Who comic strip. Mm. He was uh, new to DWM when these first appeared, and he didn't get to see Colin Baker's TV episodes until years later. So the comic Mm. stories meant a great deal to him. Mm. Um, I have volume one of Paul's wonderful comic strip companion book in my house uh, from Mm. 2012. And I'm hoping, Paul, that a volume two gets published someday. (laughs) Mm. It was great to hear from him. And Mm. he had mentioned that um, uh, he had a slight clarification for us for something we had mentioned last month. Uh Um, I had mentioned that I thought there were two covers for Voyager, um, Mm. one with and one without Perry. Well, it turns out, um, and thank you, Paul, for clarifying, that the green cover, the one with Perry, is indeed the final cover. And the earlier pinkish cover without Perry was kind of early temporary placeholder artwork. Uh And that was cut and pasted over um, an 8th Doctor collection. Interesting to... I I thought there were two actual versions. Um, I must say that I prefer the temp artwork that omits Perry, uh, who isn't in 95% of the book anyway, (laughs) and removes her enormously drawn uh, cleavage spilling out on the cover. (laughs) So I I prefer the temp artwork, but thank you, Paul, for for sharing that. Yeah. Also, Paul Schoons uh, has more than a hand in uh, in Who Killed Kennedy, from what I understand. Uh, do correct me if wrong. He he helped he, he helped Dave Bishop with uh, with the twentieth anniversary ending. Yes, in a wonderful bit of serendipity, uh, Paul is affiliated with the New Zealand Doctor Who fan club, and he was the project editor on the ebook versions for Who Killed Kennedy that we're discussing yeah. this month. So very cool. It's wonderful to have a legally free version. Mm. You know, something that's been long out of print. And, and well, I, I would just really implore, I mean, if we do happen to have any anybody else listening that is either a published author of, uh, well, of, of a Doctor Who book from the 90s or has a collection to people, I don't mind if it's free. I mean, putting on Kindle and sort of, and, and, and having people pay for it and stuff, that, that's also perfectly fine, um, if, if it's all possible. It would just be great to have these being more available so more people can share and read. Mm. Uh, I, I think it's, it, this in some ways is the kind of like the missing episodes, isn't it? Mm. In, in, a, in an odd way. Um, because, I mean, okay, sure, you can access these books you know, if you pay, you know, like a hundred quid or so on eBay or something. But it, it's always, yeah, it's just nice to know, you know go to um, sort of, you know, your favourite ebook store, buy it for you know, a sensible small amount of money and just have it in your device of choice mm-hmm. uh, in, in, yeah, in no short order. So. I think one of the other things David Bishop did for the New Zealand fan club was publish um, kind of unofficial fan adaptations of some of the missing target mm. novelizations, yes. which may still be available as well. Um, I think a few of them have since been done officially, like City of Death um, and Pirate Planet, but I think for the Eric Sayward ones in particular, those are floating around out there. 
before we get to what we're reading next month, mm. I just wanted to ask listeners to, if you could, please take a moment to leave us a rating or review in either the Google Play Store or on iTunes and the Apple Podcast app. Um, it only takes a couple of seconds, and we really want to get over the hump of being able to show up in the podcast searches when people search just Doctor Who. Because <laughs> there's there's a bunch of old podcasts, you know, some of which haven't been updated since 2011 or 2012 that show up. And, and for us to get in with those um, listings, we have to kind of mm -hmm. feed the algorithm and, and give it ratings. So if, mm -hmm. if you've liked what you've heard, please, uh, it would be wonderfully kind of you if you could take a moment and do that. And and, and and also if, if you've already done that then create a fake account and uh, like us still <laughs> <laughs> or use your partner's account <laughs> yes 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 um, grab a phone off a small child or a local ne'er do well and uh, <laughs> maybe don't do that but uh, <laughs> yeah so chris uh yeah. on that wonderful note what are we reading mm. next month so, so next month, I thought that uh, we should do a fifth Doctor book because we uh, finally, yeah, finally. <laughs> so th this will this will kind of conclude our our cycle through the Doctors. So some Doctors we've been through more than once. I thought that we should do our first missing adventure because we haven't actually done a missing adventure yet. That's right, we haven't. Wow, no, I didn't realize that. Yeah, we've done past Doctor Adventures, but we haven't done a missing adventure. So yeah, let's 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 go and let's join the fifth Doctor. Let's join Tegan. Let's join Turlo. Let's join Chameleon. Let's go to the Crystal Bucephalus. Ooh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, we, we're going to enjoy Craig Hinton's The Crystal Bucephalus. Interesting. Or Bucket Phallus, as he apparently used to pronounce it. <laughs> As they come as each <laughs> That is the one Doctor Who book that I started reading and never finished. <laughs> um, it was, I uh, I read I think I think just maybe the first couple chapters um, and then just never couldn't tell you why I stopped reading it again. You know, twenty plus years ago or so. But mm -hmm. um, huh, interesting. This guy's yeah, like you were saying. <laughs> Last month, uh, that Who Killed Kennedy, you hadn't, um, you know, maybe not so much, you know, for the quality, but just because of the format you're reading the it on. Yeah, yeah. Never finished it, but uh, same sort of story with me with, with this one, except I definitely have the paperback. <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> um, I, I like Chameleon. I like Tegan. <laughs> That's a start. <laughs> Um, I noticed you're not finishing with the rest of the Tardis. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if listeners know my thoughts about Leela, uh, to you with that in the Fifth Doctor, and uh, yeah, just not my not my favorite Doctor, but um, uh, I'm open to change my opinion. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how much your opinion has changed. Yeah, <laughs> or solidified. Well, at least it'll be interesting. Exciting. Mm. All right. Well, until next month, I've been Matt in Minnesota. Chris in South London. Happy reading. Thank you for listening to the All New Adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. Special thanks to George C. Music for use of their song, Doctor Who Theme, Swing Jazz Version. You can follow us on Twitter at ANDWBC Podcast and like us on Facebook. You can support the show by leaving us a rating and review on iTunes. You can contact the show by emailing your thoughts to ANDWBC Podcast at gmail.com. And until next month, happy reading. You got the Daily Chronicle? It is. Well, look, uh, my name's Mullins. I'm a porter at the Cottage Hospital, Ashbridge. I, I understand you pay for stories. You do. Well, look, there's something very funny happening up here. Oh, Mr. Kent's correspondent of the Daily Post. Can you tell us anything, sir? What about? Uh, what's unit doing here, sir? Is it true there's a man from space in there? Nonsense. I don't know where you get these stories. We heard there's something odd about it. I know nothing about a man from space. Uh, then why are you here, sir? Training exercise. <laughs> right. oh, now stand back, come on, men. Come on, stand back, men. Have you visited any connection with the meteorite that fell last night? If there's a story, you'll be given it later. At the moment, I have no comment to make. No, oh, no. all right, you see, come on, better than that. Stand back now, boys. Go, well, boys. I can't let you do that. It's more than my job to do. Is there another way out of here? I want to avoid the press if possible.
You know, there's a story here, Jimmy. They're trying to cover something. Lethbridge Stewart. He must have nipped out the back way. Sir, so he's not going to tell us anything. Lethbridge Stewart. The Daily What? How did you get hold of this number? Look, I have no comment to make. Now, will you please get off this line? <laughs>